Hey. Welcome, Anthony Alvix. Uh, we're glad to have you here to talk with our Peace and Justice work group today and other guests. Uh, let me just give a few brief words as introduction. Uh, Anthony has served with the Delaware Department of Elections since 2007, and he currently serves as state election commissioner. He also has a role with the National Association of Election Officials, known as the Election Center, chairing its Postal Task Force, which serves as the National Election Community's liaison with the U.S. Postal Service. He also represents the Election Center on the Postal Service, um, Service's Mailers Technical Advisory Committee and served on the boards of the National Association of State Election Directors and the Electronic Registration Information Center. So he brings lots of expertise to us tonight. Prior to work in elections, Anthony led and managed nonprofit organizations serving youth and young adults, worked in the fields of adult and youth leadership training, as well as in the banking industry. A lifelong resident of Wilmington, he is very active in and holds leadership positions in a number of community service organizations here in Delaware. So welcome, Anthony. We look forward to um, getting an update on Delaware elections and being able to throw all kinds of questions at you so that we better okay. understand where we are. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks for having me tonight. Um, and uh, happy to be here and hopefully uh, share some information with you and if you mentioned perhaps answer some questions you may have. And uh, um Basically, you know, uh, in Delaware, uh, just to give you a, a brief kind of overview even before I go into some of the slides I have, um, in Delaware, as probably a number of you probably know, especially you know, if you have been around Delaware any length of time, perhaps, um, uh, Delaware's elections uh, structure is unique really in the country. Um, elections normally is administered um, at the local level in most jurisdictions. And when, when we say local level in most states, uh, that is generally at the county level or even the city, you know, municipality level, township, whatever that local unit may be. Um, in Delaware, since um, for many, many years, and in particular since 2015, uh, we have had a single unified mm -hmm. statewide Department of Elections, which is what you see on the, the screen here. So um, we have a, um, a single department that handles everything on a statewide level. So we have uniformity in all respects, you know, pretty much here, um, which is very helpful because Delaware being small, you know, there's a lot of things in our state that are handled at the statewide level that maybe will be handled at a more local level um, in other jurisdictions. And for elections in particular, uh, I think it's very helpful because we have, as I mentioned, uniformity, um, not just the laws, of course, which are statewide in the Delaware code, you know, primarily, but um, uniformity in terms of equipment, um, uniformity and some mundane things like forms, documents, you know, that sort of thing uh, makes it a lot easier, you know, for us. So, um, yeah, we're very fortunate. And uh, I think Delaware, you know, is also very fortunate is that we have a tradition of being very, you know, com completely nonpartisan in election administration. Um, and uh, we're very, uh, I very much value that certainly and we model that in, in what we do. And it's always been the tradition, you know, even before I served in elections, we've always had that. So um, it's an honor to be here tonight and it's an honor to represent our department and uh, share some information. So um, first thing I'd like to uh, talk about, I always mention I vote. Some of you may be familiar with this. We're, this is our voter portal. I always like to put that up first just because it's a good point of entry in elections in general. We've had iVote available for over 10 years now. Um, we refreshed the format of it a couple of years back, made some updates. And as you see, there's a ton of things that you can do on iVote. It really is the self-service kind of point of contact for voters. And we try to make as much information available on our website um, as we can. We recently embarked on a, a project uh, over the past year or so. It's still ongoing and will always be ongoing, truthfully. Um, to centralize our, our website um, and to ensure that it's as user friendly and kind of information rich as possible. Um, and in Delaware, our elections administration, like as I mentioned, we're state, we're single statewide agency. We handle everything in elections. So we administer um, school board elections, school referenda. We provide the support 
um, for municipal elections. Um, we do even outreach type elections. We will of a school contacts us to do an election with regards to their you know, homecoming, you know, prom queen, school mascot, you know, we've kind of done it all, uh, all the way up to obviously the, the, the statewide elections with local, state and federal offices. But I encourage you, you know, circling back to IVO to check it out. Um, it's a really a wealth of information and it's kind of a gateway to our website where you can find a ton, a ton of information, current and historical information such as election results, documents, things of that nature. So check it out at your leisure. Um, some of the things you can do on iVote, um, you know, as I mentioned, is check and update your registration. Here in Delaware, you know, we're connected uh, very closely with the DMV, probably many of you. That has been your primary point of interaction, perhaps, with voter registration or voter updates. Um, and we've had provisions in Delaware law for a number of years now where students, uh, I say students, young people, I should say, uh, who are uh, at least... Um, at the point uh, where they're reaching the age to get the driver's license or state ID, where they can actually register to vote at, this, at the same time um, and be automatically become active by the time they are 18. As long as they are 18 by the date of the next general election, they will be eligible to vote. So um, we have that process in place. We've had it in place for a you know, number of years now. Um, also, we offer voter registration services uh, through health and social services. Primarily, that's handled by iVote these days, even before COVID. They were switching a lot of their service delivery models to self-service, as well as Department of Labor, Division of Vocational Rehabilitation you know, in particular. And then, of course, our website or coming to our, our office, um, which, again, is not quite as popular these days, and particularly since COVID, is certainly not, um, uh, certainly maybe not the preferred approach. But there's a lot of ways, basically, to register and update your registration. And we, again, we try to make it as convenient as possible for you. iVote is a, you know, really the 24-7 tool that's out there for you. Um, let's talk about some challenges. I know it's one of the items we wanted to, you know, certainly cover tonight. I mean, 2020 was a challenging year on, all around, Lord knows, for all of us. Um, what did we face in elections? Obviously, we were caught up amidst, um, you know, 2020 was kind of going along and uh, you know we were expecting obviously to be a big election year certainly of course with the presidential election and you know certainly we had new you know we were rolling out new voting equipment uh, in Delaware and we ex you know expected that to be probably the, 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 the most uh, the largest or, or most significant thing we would be facing in 2020 you know, like all of us, little did we know what was coming uh, in 2020. Um, so there was a host of things, obviously, that added to that mix. Um, we had rescheduling of, of elections, as you will recall, you know, based on uh, uh, based on the um, emergency declarations that were that were um, declared by the governor um, due to the health emergency. That we moved elections around the presidential primary. Um, school board elections, things of that nature. Municipal elections, many of them were postponed. Um, we actually changed the approach to the presidential primary. You know, in addition to the date being changed, um, the presidential primary, since there is only a single office on that ballot, unlike other elections where there are local offices based upon you know, your residence, of course, this was a single statewide office for anyone in Delaware, just based on your party affiliation. And you know, primaries in Delaware are open to Democrats or Republicans. The same is true for a presidential primary. So we, we were basically uh, directed to take a different approach under those emergency declarations. We essentially had um, what are known as vote centers. We didn't have the full number of polling places open. Um, again, presidential primary turnout generally is a bit lower than other elections, so certainly that was, um, you know, certainly workable, and that was obviously in very early days of, of COVID and um, at a very heightened level of uh, concern at that time. Then, of course, we had the major shift to vote by mail and absentee, um, you know, per the, uh, the health emergency and the governor's emergency declaration, as you may recall, of course, uh, absentee ballot applications were mailed to voters for the presidential primary. And then the General Assembly subsequently passed legislation to enact vote by mail, um, which is functionally very similar to absentee, but um, unlike absentee, does not require a, re a reason to request the ballot. 
Um, the General Assembly authorized that through legislation for the 2020 election cycle. Um, that was for this, the primary and general election. That legislation, when, and it, the way it was written, it uh, sunsetted, as they call it. So when it, it essentially automatically repealed itself in January of this year, January 12th of 2021. So it was the way it was written, it was always intended to be just for the election uh, cycle. So what did that mean? Um, we, of course, had the subsequent mailings of applications, again, to uh, those eligible voters, again, in the primary, Democrats and Republicans, all eligible voters in the general election, completely changed the way we approach things. So in addition to, as we moved, again, into the primary and general in addition to recruiting of poll workers um, in the midst of COVID, trying to ensure we had polling places in the midst of COVID, uh, we were mailing out many, many, many uh, ballot applications. Um, and then obviously we saw our volume of ballots rise significantly. Delaware historically- You guys coming in here? Had had a, um, 20, about 25,000 absentee ballots was the maximum no. number no. of absentee no. ballots we in the had kitchen. in Delaware in the yep. prior election. Um, so we had uh, almost 200,000 for the general. So tremendous increase. So we needed to, to scale up, obviously automate a lot of the processes because a lot of what we did historically was, was, was done by hand, very manually because of the volume. Um, and we had to very quickly obtain equipment and supplies, you know, automation equipment, machines to handle the mailing, the incoming, the outgoing, and really literally do that you know, overnight. I mean, and sometimes almost literally in the span of, of days, um, things that normally would take weeks or months. Um, so it was a really pretty, pretty tremendous and unbelievable in many respects. And of course, the, the, challenge, the challenges continued. You know, obviously I mentioned poll workers and polling places. We had poll workers obviously had concerns. I mean, some of you, in fact, you know, may be poll workers or may know poll workers and, you know, trying to retain them, trying to make them provide a safe environment. Some polling places decided to no longer be a polling place because out of concerns around COVID. Obtaining PPE, you know, the personal protective equipment, that was really a scramble, certainly earlier in the year. Uh, got a little better as we proceeded through the year and supply chains got a little more regular, uh, a little more regular and a little more uh, structured. Um, but it was a challenge, certainly, especially for the presidential primary. And then adapting our, you know, our procedures, again, not just PPE, but trying to maintain distancing. Um, getting the word out, educating voters about the changes, there's a ton of changes, um, and obviously a very short time to communicate them. Um, a lot of disinformation. You know, obviously, you, you all, I'm sure, look quite familiar with that very false information out there, uh, in addition to um, the challenges, and that just compounds the situation, certainly. I've mentioned the rollout of the equipment, which again, we thought would be the initial you know, primary focus we would be having in 2020. Um, and then time frames. Delaware elections, and this is distinct from anything to do with COVID, certainly. Delaware elections, um, as all of you know, so I'm sure, you know, being an informed group, um, our primary election, for example, our state primary is very late you know, in the year, relatively late in the year, you know, it's in mid-September, um, generally the second Tuesday of September. So it's an extremely tight turnaround for um, the, the general election. And I mentioned what's called UACAVA voters. I try not to use a lot of acronyms, but I apologize for some. Uh, UACAVA um, is an acronym standing for Uniformed Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act. That's the federal law um, and a few laws over the years, but the original federal law that provided a lot of um, uh, a lot of safeguards uh, in place for military and overseas citizens. Uh, what that means in practical terms to us is that ballots for those individuals have to be out within 45 days prior to an election. Um, so to give you an example where we were um, where with the September primary, um, by the time you know, the primary was September 15th, we generally um, have the results confirmed uh, and certified by the 17th. So that was Tuesday, then a Thursday. That Saturday, the 19th, was when those absentee uh, ballots for military and overseas citizens had to get out in the mail. 
So meaning that everything had to be transitioned over in an incredibly short period of time. Um, so again, very, you know, obviously very stressful for all our staff. Um, and then the general election canvas. Canvas means the certification of results. In Delaware, um, the general election and the, or a special election, which is essentially a, a general election to fill a vacancy, um, the canvas is conducted by what's called the board of canvas, which is superior court. Um, the superior court in each county sitting as a board of canvas. That convenes at 10 a.m. on Thursday following the general election. So you immediately, you really, again, very little time for transition. So all those timelines are tight in a, in a, a perfect situation, if you will, not that anything's ever perfect, but you add all the COVID um, uh, challenge to that. And it really, really was quite a, uh, quite a year. Um, you know, our staff, we have a, one of the things I really value is our tremendous staff and they really were tremendous. Our permanent staff and then our temporary folks that came in, they really, really went above and beyond. Uh, they do all anyway, and they certainly did more so under extraordinary circumstances this year. Um, let's talk about the future, kind of what we're planning uh, in the future. And I'll mention some more in detail a little bit down the line. Um, obviously, we're going to have more time to share information with voters, particularly about any of the changes that are coming up. And I'll mention some changes that are um, that will be coming down the line based on recent legislation. Uh, we're, we are looking to, um, and in the process of increasing our presence on other uh, social media channels, we've always had a good online presence. I mentioned the website and such, but broadening our footprint in social media and other, other channels uh, to spread the word. Um, Adapting to changing voter behaviors. We know a lot of voters uh, for 2020 um, shifted to voting uh, by absentee ballot or by mail. Um, obviously, I mentioned some of the legislative considerations, you know, for the future, but, you know, longer term, you know, perhaps more people may shift to absentee, you know, perhaps if vote by mail returns, you know, how, how, how many people will adapt to that um, uh, and use that as their primary approach. Early voting is coming, I'll mention that in a bit too. So again, that's considerations. And then of course, maintaining the voting equipment. I mentioned we have you know, recently obtained, when I say recent, past couple of years now, new voting equipment, obviously that always needs to be maintained to the highest standards of certification. And then always one, one of the things we're, we're mindful of is adapting to any future legislatively mandated updates or changes based on what the General Assembly or perhaps the federal government um, you know, may enact. So uh, coming up, uh, 2022, <clears throat> excuse me, municipal elections. I know, you know, many, um, you know, people, you know, for example, if some folks here are um, city Wilmington residents, you know, and I'm a city Wilmington resident myself, city Wilmington elections by state law are on the, the general election ballot or the primary ballot. I mentioned earlier municipal elections that we administer. Delaware has it, believe it or not, has 57 municipalities. And um, not all of them necessarily have elections, but many do. Um, so again, I mentioned we administer those. Those are all over the map. And generally, many times of the year, any week, any weekend, Saturday, there's a municipal election going on somewhere in Delaware that our office is supporting. Um, Delaware, uh, just a little side note on that, in municipal elections in Delaware by Delaware law, Delaware code, each municipality has a municipal board of elections. So that the municipal board actually is who technically by law administers the election, oversees it. Our department provides support, as I mentioned to that. What, what does that mean? That means that we provide uh, the equipment, they're mandated by law to use the voting equipment, the state voting equipment. We, prov we pr obviously prepare those, prepare the ballots based on their specifications, offices up for election, things of that nature. We provide not just the machines, but we provide all of the materials that they need, a lot of the documents, which are really adapted from what we use on the statewide level. Um, we provide training to their boards, um, uh, to, the, to the staff of the municipality on election administration, as well as to their poll workers. And usually our folks, or actually always, our folks are there on election day and generally, you know, opening and closing the, the polls, or, assembly, or I should say assisting, in, in some cases, the, the local poll workers with that. School boards come up May, May 10th. They're always the second Tuesday in May, except last year, of course, when everything was different. <laughs> They're usually, I should say, the second Tuesday in May. Um, 
school district referenda. As many of you know, of course, uh, Delaware law permits a, a school district board of education to authorize a referendum election to raise additional tax revenue. Um, could be for operating expenses, could be for capital expense, such as a building or, or such. Um, that, of course, is authorized by the school district. Under state law, we conduct all those elections. We have a full election calendar at elections.delaware.gov. The 2021 calendar is up now. We'll have the 22 calendar up uh, as soon as it's available. It's basically in development right now. Um, vote by mail, I mentioned that that was available for 2020. Uh, was House Bill 346, uh, to be specific, that um, authorized that. As I also mentioned, that expired, and that was in the original, the drafting of the legislation, expired on January 12th, 2021. So vote by mail does not per se exist now in Delaware. It would have to be you know, authorized by legislation again. Um, absentee voting continues to and always existed in Delaware law, even when vote by mail was in place. And again, absentee voting in its broadest sense is if one is unable to go to your polling place on election day for a reason provided on the, the affidavit. Uh, the affidavit basically is the ballot request form. The reasons are defined by state law. Um, Delaware has, an, has always been a self-affirmation state, meaning that uh, if you request an absentee ballot, you are affirming you know, under penalty of law, um, that you're authorized to vote by absentee uh, ballot, that you're unable to appear at your polling place. Again, it's a self-affirmation. We do not require additional proof or documentation for that. That's the way it's always been in Delaware law. So it's, it's uh, up to the voter. A little bit more about how absentee voting works. Um, many of you may have used it in the past. Um, we can mail ballots, um, up to four days prior to the election. Best practice though, and you heard in the intro, I work a lot with the Postal Service. So I'm kind of a mail geek, um, if you will, amongst other geekiness, I guess. Um, definitely, uh, you know, we have a great rapport with the Postal Service and the Postal Service, you know, by and large, in my experience, certainly dealing with elections, it's certainly our local people who do a really great job, fantastic job. It's always the best practice though, to request your ballot. Um, at least at the latest seven days in advance, just makes sense, just to avoid any, you know, any, any um, stress. Um, we do offer, um, and we have historically offered in-person absentee voting in our offices. I mentioned early voting and I'll get to that in a moment, but we do offer that um, up to noon the day before the election. So, you know, for example, historically, if you found yourself in a situation where, um, you have a sick relative, you have an unexpected business travel, um, some other situations arisen and you didn't have time, you didn't anticipate voting by absentee ballot. You could come into our office up to noon the day before the election um, to request a ballot and to vote. Now, Delaware is for returning ballots on the other end. We are what's called a ballot in hand state, meaning that uh, the ballot must be returned, the voted absentee ballot, the completed absentee ballot must be returned to our office, the office in fact that issued the ballots would be in the respective county in which you reside by close of polls time, eight o'clock on election day. Delaware is not a state that um, abides by postmarks or anything of that nature. Some, some states have those requirements. We are a ballot in hand as it's called state. One of the primary reasons for that is because in our law, te technically in our constitution is where that board of canvas requirement is that I mentioned a few minutes ago, for example, um, where the, the uh, certification of the election starts that Thursday um, following the election day. And for the primaries, you know, we, we have to get that done immediately because of the absentee ballot um, and overseas uh, requirements. So that's another one of the primary reasons that is that we have to have everything pretty much in house by that time so we can begin that canvas process. I did mention military and overseas. Um, it's a similar process for domestic citizens, if you will. There is a particular form um, that the um, those folks can use. Um, there are some additional extended deadlines and they do have an opportunity uh, to receive them. So we have a secure means to send them uh, electronically um, that is also uh, permitted by state, federal and state law. We've done that actually for a number of years. 
Um, but there are some special provisions made for military and overseas per the UACAVA. Um, for absentee voting, Delaware permits um, a number of options, a single election, all elections in an election cycle, or permanent absentee status. Um, Delaware's had a permanent absentee status for many, you know, for a number of years, more than uh, 12 years, I would say now at this point. Um, and that allows you, again, it's all self-affirmation, as I mentioned. Um, if you haven't, some of those reasons listed, such as ongoing health issues, mobility issues, things of that nature, you can request to be a permanent absentee voter. And then you will never have to request a ballot again. Now that doesn't mean, just so you know, that doesn't mean that you're always required to vote by permanent, uh, permanently by absentee. If you're even, even if you're on permanent absentee status, you always have that option to come to the polling place. Um, most people choose not to. You know, they have a specific reason why they're permanent, um, and you always have the option to cancel your permanent absentee status as well. If you ever change your lifestyle or life situation changes, you certainly have that right to do that. But it's available to you. Voters with disabilities, again, a, a primary reason, um, one of the primary reasons folks vote absentee, but certainly we welcome all voters at the polling place, of course. I mentioned permanent status. We have the accessible options for the ballots. Um, but however, our new voting, I still call it new, even though it's really not brand new anymore. Um, it's relatively new since the prior, prior equipment we had was 20, almost 25 years. I still call it new equipment. Um, the... Um, the voting machines that we have now, and again, just because of a, the way technology is advanced, is they have tremendously um, enhanced accessibility features. Um, some of you may have seen these or experienced them or seen a demo. Um, things such as the ability to adjust the size of the text and contrast on the, on the screen. We have a universal voting console, and I'll show an image of that in a moment. Um, the universal voting console it provides a lot of modalities for individuals. Um, there are braille, braille interpretations of the various buttons on this console. There are different shapes, different colors, raised edges. They have a, a, a compatibility um, for headphones because you can, anyone can hear, uh, any, and anyone can use the UBC. I just want to reiterate that anyone can use it, even if you just like to try it. Um, there is a uh, compatibility in the UBC for a complete audio presentation of the ballot, um, which can be uh, sped up or slowed down in terms of speed by the voter. Um, the, the device has full compatibility with assistive devices for folks with limited mobility, like sip and puff devices. Someone has a significant um, physical challenge like upper, in their upper body strength or significant mobility issue, and they um, operate through a sip and puff type of modality. You may have seen those. Uh, types of uh, those types of devices that's compatible with our voting machines. Um, there's also the, always the option to bring someone uh, to assist. Um, I put that disclaimer in there that is in law. It's kind of one of those older provisions of the law. It cannot be the employer agent of the employer, um, or it could it can be a child up to age 16. You can invite someone to assist you in the polling booth if you wish. Or if you are unable, um, uh, you need assistance, you have no one with you, ask for assistance from election officers. We, would, we generally would have two election officers of different political affiliations. Again, we try to keep that balanced in the polling place. Try, we'd send those an individu individuals in with the voter, try to provide us, maintain as much privacy for the voter, but provide whatever assistance the voter desires. It's really the comfort level of the voter, how much assistance they need. And we instruct our poll workers in their training, you know, again, to be respectful of the voter, how much assistance they desire or wish to have. Please, you know, offer it, be helpful, but, you know, certainly let the voter be as independent as possible. Talk a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, pardon me, election security measures. We know that's a, a major uh, concern, certainly, you know, over many years and certainly very recently. Um, we have a, a number of security measures end to end in place. Um, voter registration applications, um, as you know, many, many of the um, voters uh, obtain uh, their registration or update their registration through the DMV, as I mentioned. Um, no, uh, DMV has, has um, 
And that's the vast, vast majority of our registrations, the overwhelming majority of our registrations. Uh, the DMV has provisions in place that confirm um, citizenship status and ensure that only those individuals who are uh, authorized to, to register to vote based on their um, citizenship status, being i.e. being a U.S. citizen or naturalized U.S. citizen, are uh, provided that opportunity to register. Also, um, all applications and, and, and even existing applications for those currently registered do pass um, a felon check. Now, uh, in Delaware, Delaware law has changed in a number of ways over the years with regards to um, uh, enfranchisement of those convicted of a felony. As Delaware law stands today, um, essentially only individuals, unless uh, you're convicted of what's called a disqualifying felony, there's certain you know, quite serious crimes that can permanently restrict one um, from registering to vote things such as capital crimes, such as murder, sexual offenses, um, misuse of public funds. Other than that, um, individuals who may have been convicted of a felony if they complete the terms um, of their, uh, of their uh, confinement, as well as any probation or parole, uh, they are permitted to register again. Uh, in recent years, the changes have included um, dropping any requirement for financial remuneration, fines, and restitution, as they usually call it. Um, and then Delaware used to have actually a five-year waiting period. In addition to serving terms of your sentence, payment of fines, and there was a five-year waiting period. Those two have been dropped, the waiting period and the, um, the fines that have been dropped. Um, for voting equipment, we have um, pre-election, we call it logic and accuracy, LNA testing and certification. Um, and these are things that are posted, you'll see on our website as we get close to elections. There are actual public meetings, you can come and observe it at our facilities and our warehouses. All the machines, and you know, one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the um, prerequisites when we purchased the new equipment, when we went to, to bid for the new equipment, was of course that we wanted a paper ballot backup. Um, that was one of the one of the prerequisites. Um, so that's what that lodge neck and accuracy test entails. You know, running in a, in a, um, a, a test mode, um, running the machines, running sample uh, votes on the machines, uh, obtaining the paper ballots, and comparing those results at the end. Again, doing this on a, in a test environment on the machines, so that the machines are, you know, then ready to go out. You know, on uh, to the polling places. Um, and then physically reviewing all those materials, okay? Physically reviewing those paper ballots, comparing them to the actual readout tapes from the machines. Um, and again, I'm always, you know, very happy to say certainly, you know, we've done many, many hundreds, thousands at this point in logic and actually testing of the machines um, and always 100% accurate, um, always 100% accurate. And I also wanna make sure to just to mention this and to be very, very clear, crystal clear about this, our voting equipment is never capitalized intentionally, never connected to the internet, nor even capable of being connected to the internet. That was a prerequisite in the machines when we went to bid for the equipment. The machines have no, no equipment in, in the devices at all that are capable of connection, uh, would even permit a connection to the internet in any shape or form. And that's also tied in with um, uh, our machines are, are certified by state law to the most current federal certification of the voting equipment. And that's also a requirement there. Um, we have safeguards to prevent voting by more than one method. And, and certainly this came into play this past election cycle when we had so many people voting by absentee or mail ballot. Uh, when you check in at the polling place in the recent elections, as you may have experienced, you have a poll book, which is the kind of device, tablet device in a stand where you sign in versus the old paper poll list. We have um, protocols in place now, uh, certainly, and that was a prerequisite when the, this equipment was purchased. Again, looking to the future, thinking about when we would you know, have things like early voting um, or in, and or increased use of absentee voting, that individuals um, who have voted, for example, by an absentee ballot, who requested an absentee ballot, uh, and returned an absentee ballot. Uh, for example, if uh, someone, I was used the situation, if someone by mistake, by accident, you know, requested an absentee ballot many months ago and maybe, you know, forgot doing so. We've, you know, we've had some cases of doing that. And someone then went to the polling place 
um, they are already noted as having a ballot returned and they are therefore unable to vote. Now, the, the, the system does give us flexibility so that if you have a situation, let's say, where someone did request an absentee ballot, I mentioned those mailings last year, maybe someone requested an absentee ballot for all elections early in the year when the first mailing went out before the presidential primary. By the time the general election arrived, yes, they may have received an absentee ballot in the mail or vote, or vote by mail ballot at that point, but then they decided they did not want to vote out by that, that means in which to go to the polling place. Systems also provide that capability to show that, yes, a ballot was mailed, but it was not returned. So that individual still maintains their ability to vote at the polling place. So there are those, you know, those safeguards in place. And after the election, and I've mentioned pre-election, election day, after the election, we do have the post-election audits um, that are in Delaware code. Again, these are also posted to public meetings and they're randomly selected machines and districts where we literally do a hand recount of the ballots, compare those to the results um, that are produced you know, on election day. And uh, again, I'm happy to say we've, we've done that many, many times now, always 100% accurate. And then in addition to that, we have post-election reviews of voting history. Again, checking just to ensure that there is um, you know, an individual, there are no individuals that have voted more than once. Um, and you know, any instances, you know, in any instance, if that were to happen, um, those are referred to law enforcement. Our elections is not a law enforcement agency. We don't have law enforcement powers. We're an administrative agency. But any situations like that, we work you know, hand in hand with the uh, Department of Justice, Delaware Department of Justice, the Attorney General's office, which handles law enforcement. So certainly anything of that nature uh, would be referred to the G Attorney General's office. Um, certainly for, for follow-up. Cybersecurity protocols, very rigorous cybersecurity protocols. Delaware is very fortunate. Our Department of Technology and Information, um, which is the state's technology arm, um, is our very close partner. We have IT staff on, we have an IT team, uh, you know, a fairly small team because we're a fairly small agency, but we work with um, DTI hand in hand, end to end, as well as our federal partners. You, may, you, know, you perhaps have heard of um, CISA, the um, federal agencies under Homeland Security um, that are concerned with cybersecurity. Again, we work very closely with them. They have representatives in this, that work with the state. Um, and again, all of that um, is an ongoing, not just an election cycle, that's an ongoing uh, process, constant interaction with them, constant vigilance, constant proactive um, activities to ensure uh, the highest level of security. And then voter registration and list maintenance. You take a quick drink here. Maintaining the voter registration list um, you know, is certainly very important, especially last year, obviously we a lot of mailings went out um, and to folks to whom, you know, perhaps we have not uh, mailed anything in a long time. And that's, you know, proved very helpful to us. The mail that uh, was returned to us um, as not deliverable is used to maintain the voter registration list. The first item, and again, again, try to avoid a lot of acronyms, but sometimes you need it. Um, the first item under that voter registration list maintenance, NVRA, that's the National Voter Registration Act. In a nutshell, that's the federal law, which Delaware law also mirrors, incorporates. Um, there are certain provisions in place in, in federal law and again, state law that are certain safeguards, meaning that for voter registration lists, we are not permitted to just simply take someone off the rolls without documentation. So I say return to mail in parentheses here. What does that mean? Basically, per the provisions of NVRA, the uh, key provision of voter list maintenance is if an item sent to a voter is returned, either from us, from another state agency, for example, um, some of you receive postcards like from your legislators, happy birthday cards, you know, just use that as an example. If things like that are returned, we send a mailing out to, poll, to a voter, it's returned. That is the, in, in allows us to initiate the list maintenance process, meaning that um, after that initial mailing is returned, we send what's called a confirmation mailing out um, that generally would, it would go either to 
the same um, same address if we do not have a supplement a supplemental address, or if the individual you know has information from the postal service, for example, indicating they moved and a forwarding address is provided, we'll use that address, and we contact the individual asking them to reconfirm their status. Um, are you still at the address we have? Could it have been a mistake? You know, maybe there was an alternate mail carrier on the route that day. You know, maybe the, even the regular mail carrier made a mistake. You know, who knows? Um, you know, was it a mistake? You know, do you still live there? Have you moved somewhere else in the, in the state? Do we need to update your address? Or, you know, subsequently, have you moved out of state? Especially if we receive an address um, from the postal service that someone moved out of state, we will, again, mail to that address and ask them, um, have you moved out of state? We'll cancel your registration. Um, and we generally, you know, we get a good amount of those back. However, um, you know, many we don't. Um, but if we don't get that returned piece of con that confirmation mailing back, the process continues. And basically, uh, once we have sent that confirmation mailing, either we hear back, if we don't hear back, um, after a period of 60 days, that person becomes what's called inactive meaning that they're still a voter, but that there's a flag in our system that they need to verify their address. And if we have no further contact with the voter and two consecutive general election cycles pass, that person is removed from the rolls. Doesn't mean they can't re-register in the future at some point, say if they move back to Delaware. But um, the, the, this process was put into place, uh, NVRA passed in 1993, it was put into place to standardize the procedures nationwide for list maintenance. Um, and it provides certain safeguards so that there's not arbitrary removals of folks, but it provides a structure for that, which, which is great. Now, quick note on that. If someone is in an active status, let's say, again, you know, a, a mailing was returned, we sent a confirmation mailing, we didn't hear back for whatever reason, and that voter then um, wishes to vote on election day. Uh, let's say they in fact have not moved. Again, it could have been a mistake with the mail. I mentioned that they were flagged in our system. If that voter were to request a ballot or were to show up at their polling place on election day, there is a flag in, this, in the system, on the poll book, that will indicate that the poll worker must verify their address before the person is allowed to vote, ensuring they must produce documentation that they in fact live there in that district and are eligible to vote. And then we can update their records and make them active again. Um, so that, that's a, a key provision of that. So that existed for many years. Um, we also have the Division of Vital Statistics, which is another state agency that provides us monthly updates of individuals who, are who have passed away, who are deceased. Um, so that helps us again to maintain our roles. Um, that's an, become, it used to be a, a manual paper system, now it's been automated for a number of years. Um, it's a very helpful system and it really um, is, is very instrumental. The next one is ERIC, again, sorry, another acronym, the Electronic Registration Information Center. This has probably been the biggest advance we've made in maintaining voter registration lists. Delaware was a founding member of ERIC. ERIC's a consortium of now 31, hopefully soon to be two, three, ideally eventually all 50 states that um, have entered into an agreement, and this is permitted uh, by Delaware law, uh, Delaware law, had to be updated several years, many years ago now to permit us to, uh, to participate in this uh, project. ERIC is a consortium of states, as I mentioned, more than 30 now, um, where information is shared from voter registration files as well as uh, motor vehicle files, the Div Division of Motor Vehicle or whatever the respective motor vehicle licensing agency is in the state. And that is a tremendous, tremendous boon to us because that we've received reports and Delaware receives them monthly and we process them monthly where we receive updates through ERIC of individuals who are believed to have moved out of state because they've either registered to vote in another state or obtained a driver's license in another state. And that allows us then to uh, kind of streamline that contact process I mentioned earlier under NVRA. So we can mail directly to a uh, what is generally always a very good new address and have the person confirm that they have in fact moved out of state and then we can cancel the registration. We've done that for, uh, we've been in ERIC now for more than eight years, almost nine years. That's been tremendously helpful for us. And then finally, um, 
we have a self or close relative cancellation process. Delaware law permits this. So you can certainly self like, I report to us that you've moved out of state, um, which we greatly appreciate. Um, or if you've had a close relative who's moved out of state, uh, an adult child, we have that on our website. There's a, a cancellation form that you can um, submit um, as a parent, for example, or if you've had a spouse or a your own parent maybe who's passed away, um, you can report that to us as well. What are some updates in Delaware elections? I've covered some of these, but I'll just go through them briefly. I mentioned uh, the paper audit trail in technical terms. The elections world is called the voter verified paper audit trail, meaning it's the paper ballot that you can view in the voting machine and it is an auditable ballot. As I mentioned, that's what's used um, in the audit process. Um, and then again, easier to use in uh, voting equipment with greater accessibility options. We mentioned the poll box and all the, uh, all the tools that it gives us. Uh, we've had advanced, enhanced reporting on election night. Uh, we've revamped how the results are reported on election night. Uh, it's much more, the appearance is much more modern, but more importantly than that, there's a lot more tools to analyze the results. They used to be more of a, a flat, if you will, presentation, not graphical. Um, now there's a lot more tools. It, does, it looks better, but it also is more ways to slice and dice the data, especially. This piece right here is um, just a quick reference card, kind of, uh, again, just kind of goes over how the machines work um, in the polling place. Again, as many of you, you may have experienced them in an election already, where you check in at the poll book, you get a, the, the paper ballot um, that uh, is a blank ballot that will become your voted ballot. Use the machine to make your selections, review them, and then press vote, and the ballot goes into the secure ballot box. And the, as I mentioned on this screen here, we have a complete, uh, another one of our security measures is physical, I mentioned cybersecurity, testing, uh, pre and post election testing and auditing. We also have the, the, the nuts and bolts kind of uh, security as well, such as um, chains of custody on all our all our devices, um, serialized physical seals, uh, locks, things like that, uh, seals on the machines that are logged on the documentation in the polling place to ensure that um, the machines have been when they are sealed and leave the polling leave our warehouse and go to a polling place location you know, that they have been un, undisturbed. Um, similarly, at the end of the night, um, additional um, serialized seals are applied to the machines uh, as they are closed out and when they're transported back to, the, to our warehouses to maintain that complete chain of custody and be documented throughout the entire life cycle of the election. Also like to mention, <clears throat> uh, again, trying to debunking, you know, any, any false information that's out there. Um, you know, barcodes on ballots, questions about um, can ballots ever be tied back to the voter? They cannot. Um, if you've used the Excel machine, you've probably seen that there are um, uh, barcodes on the ballots. That's how the ballot um, is in, in one way, how it is read. Um, and also our, uh, gives us the capability to, for example, if, if we have a, I would have a large recount, where it would be impractical to hand recount all of, the, all of the ballots. You know, we have our equipment that can scan the ballots just like our absentee. Uh, our new equipment, again, I still call it new, is all intercompatible, our absentee and our polling place equipment. Um, but I you know, just want everybody to know there, this barcode simply identify the, the style of the ballot, meaning the offices that are on the ballot based on the district in which you live and um, your selections that are on there. There's no personal identifiable information. It doesn't even tell us, it tells us the election, it tells us the district you live in, doesn't tell us what machine you use, doesn't tell us the time the date stamp. Um, I mean, the elect, I should say the election dates on there, I beg your pardon, but doesn't have any anything like a date time stamp that could tie it back to you, certainly. Um, and that's by design, again, by design. This is that universal voting console I mentioned earlier. I'm using, my, I'm using my cursor here, if you don't mind. Again, the, the raised edges, the different colored and shaped buttons, the braille uh, uh, translation, the um, interconnection for your uh, headphones for the uh, audio representation of the ballot, and then the assistive device interface there for a sip and puff or other assistive device. I mentioned post-election audits. Those audits are 
three phase, just so you know, it's random selections of an individual machine. Uh, um, and again, this is based on per county or the city of Wilmington is also uh, carved out in this um, uh, random machine, random district and the random statewide office, always selected from different election districts. So you get a wide cross section of machines. As I mentioned, they're manual counts of the human readable text. These are open to the public, these uh, audits. And we've had certainly members of the public come there and even help us um, under, you know, with us, you know, with our staff, of course, they're um, obviously supervising, but have even helped us physically count the ballots. We want people to see that, you know, to see hands on how it works. Um, and it's uh, very interesting. What else is coming up in Delaware elections? I mentioned early voting. There'll be a vote center. I mentioned those vote centers back uh, kind of similar to what we did for the presidential primary. There, there'll be a vote center, um, uh, meaning that everyone in a county, anyone who resides in a certain county could vote at any of the early voting locations in that county. You wouldn't be tied to the individual polling place like you would be on election day. Starts in 22. Um, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, minimum of 10 days. So ending on the Sunday preceding the election day. Minimum locations, uh, certainly, of course, we're planning for more, um, but that is the what's in the law. So that's new. Um, also starting next year, or, or excuse me, starting when the, in, the uh, legislation signed uh, into law, which it's not yet, is there'll be background checks for school district candidates, school board candidates. They'll be required uh, to pass, uh, to submit to a background check for child serving agencies. That is new, that was legislation passed this, this uh, recent session. Um, municipal elections, I mentioned we do those. Um, as I mentioned, they're governed by local boards of election. They're also governed uh, ultimately by the municipal charter. Each municipality has a charter um, which dictates um, various ways they operate. And uh, elections is always um, spelled out in that charter. So some municipalities have changed their charters um, in this past election, excuse me, this past legislative session. Uh, for example, uh, they've made a number of changes, but some of them have moved to move using the state's voter registration system versus requiring local registration, meaning you no longer have to register with the town. But if you're a registered voter in the state and you reside in the boundaries of the municipality, you can vote in that election without an additional need to register with the town. There was also some updates to our campaign finance laws. Our office also manages that. That, uh, for those who don't know, that is uh, what candidates are required to report um, publicly available reports showing what they've collected and expended. There were some changes to, for example, the, um, the limits at which reporting, some certain types of reporting are required that was passed by the General Assembly. There was also <clears throat> automatic voter registration, which will be available at the DMV. So anyone who is not registered, they will automatically, based, based on legislation the General Assembly passed, they will automatically be registered to vote. We don't have a date that'll be rolled out yet. It is um, a, th up to a three year window, uh, up to three years for that to be implemented. Uh, we're anticipating based on some of the uh, behind the scenes types of work that needs to be done that'll probably be after the 22 election is when that'll come into play, we're anticipating. Um, redistricting. All of you have probably heard about that. We all know about the census and how the census was impacted by the 2020, um, by the pandemic, I should say. Um, the 2020 census data, or I should say the redistricting data, which is what the various entities that redistrict their, um, their various representative districts used, was just released on 8-12. It was actually scheduled to be released this past Monday, 8-16, but it was moved up to the 12th. Um, so we in the Department of Elections, where we come into it is, for example, the General Assembly, after they redraw the House and the Senate, which in our case, the General Assembly does that, they, they handle that, then we would adjust the election districts, you know, which are called precincts in many places. Uh, we call them EDs here, election districts, that we would be updating them. We also provide support for local um, governments, uh, for example, Newcastle County Council, by Delaware law, the county council redistricts their districts, and the city of Wilmington, by municipal code, Wilmington code, they have a commission as well, like Newcastle does. Um, Newcastle has a commission, which is a representative of each of the districts. It's not any sitting members. Um, the Wilmington City Council, the Wilmington City 
a redistricting commission is a little bit different, does include some members of the city council. And again, that's all governed by code and or municipal um, authority. We provide the support. We do not make any decisions about district lines. Um, again, we work on the election districts level and that's purely administrative. But we don't make any decisions. That's up to the respective bodies. Um, they will be in effect for the 2022 primary in general, those new districts. And also in 22, um, again, like we do before all elections, um, polling place cards are mailed to individuals um, uh, before the election with your polling place listed. Um, certainly you'll be seeing information about early voting coming out as well. If you ever make a change to your record, a polling place card uh, generally is sent for that as well to confirm that as well. And because any initiated changes or as well as, as I mentioned, any polling place changes. If we have a need to change a polling place, which we certainly try not to outside of redistricting unless it's an emergency like COVID, um, we would send an update as well, polling place card or perhaps even a letter. Um, so I'm getting close to the end of my uh, slides here. Um, we ask you to serve as a poll worker if you haven't done so. We encourage you to con consider doing so. Get paid, it's fun. You learn a lot, there's great training um, and it's very exciting. And, and our poll workers are always our heroes because they get the job done and they were our heroes even more this past election cycle, Lord knows. Um, and more information is on our, on our website as well. And I mentioned our website earlier, tons and tons and tons of info current as well as historical, go to find a ton of information, um, do research, a lot of people do students, um, researchers, just general members of the public, it's a lot to offer there. And then follow us on social media. I mentioned we're expanding our social media presence. So we can try to get that as much out there as we can, deadlines, information about candidate filings, useful information, news, news you can use sort of stuff. So that is it, I will stop sharing my screen now, if I can do that. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so thank you. I know it's talked a lot, so I apologize. That was a lot, a lot of talking, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you, that was wonderful. That was so educational, I really appreciate it. Sure. Um, if folks don't mind, I will keep the recording going through the Q&A, figuring folks who want to um, catch us on the other side of this, we'll be able to benefit from that as well. If anyone would like to ask something that they don't want recorded, just let me know and I will turn it off. And with that, with that, we'll open up the floor to questions. And I did mute some of you, so please um, unmute as needed. Sure. Sally. Yes, I have a question. Oh, yes. I think Sally had her hand up first. Sally, you wanna go and then we'll go to Norm. Um, thanks. Okay. Um, Anthony, I, I want to say, first of all, I had some questions um, in the last election and I contacted the Department of Elections and, and you all were just extremely helpful. Oh, I really appreciate that, especially good. with all that you had going on. So thank you. Good. Um, and I have one question. Uh, um, I, I'm, you, you, I think you answered this, but um, in the case of some, I'm, in case, I'm, it's, it's a question about who goes off the voter rolls. The case right. of someone uh, you haven't been able to contact and they haven't voted for two mm -hmm. cycles. They go off the rolls. What happens if they show up at a poll to vote after that? After that, they would have to re-register because that, after that point, their registration is in fact canceled. So they would actually have to re-register in that case um, because at that point they are considered removed from the rolls and they literally would have to register again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Norm? If the people, school districts periodically have referenda rate to raise school taxes, mm -hmm. do you have any role in that? Uh, we do, yeah, that's, uh, when I say we do, we administer the election. Um, we provide the support basically to it. It's the school, the individual school district board of education that authorizes that. Um, they actually authorize the election, authorize um, the, the actual vote. Uh, mechanically, um, the way it works, in addition to us, you know, setting up polling places, having absentee voting, that sort of thing, um, they do have to give us, um, they're required to provide us the notice of election. Um, and we do have an opportunity to review that and offer um, our suggestions on that. 
you know, we realize that a lot of times those are quite complex, especially if they're tax referenda uh, types of questions. I mean, they're, I mean, they're always financial, but, um, but we try to offer feedback. Um, and, and, you know, certainly with, we confer, we're, we can't offer legal, you know, advice to the school boards per se, but we offer advice on perhaps how to make the um, ballot a little clearer or as clear as possible. Um, but we realize it's, it's still often, you know, there's a lot, yes, especially when there are multiple questions, but we do administer those. Many years ago, um, some of you may remember many years ago, the school districts, in fact, administered school elections. And there was a change in Delaware law um, more than 15 years ago now that brought that under, um, under our umbrella um, and, ensure, and we and make sure that we administer them. So, but so we so do, the, yes. So the school board can de determine the date they announce there's gonna be a referenda and they select the date of the referenda. They do, they consult with us. They are asked to consult with us, but ultimately they set the date. <laughs> So we really don't per se have the authority to refuse a date. You know, we certainly would discourage them, like, for example, from doing it, you know, <laughs> a day before the general election. Um, but we've had some that are quite close um, as well. And um, the uh, it's uh, yeah, it's one of those it's, it's one of those situations where um, sometimes it's balancing it. Now, just so you know, and many of you may know this by Delaware law, um, a school district may run two referenda in one calendar year. That's not a, I should say a 12 month period, not a calendar year. Only if the, and you've, I'm sure you've seen this certainly in your experience too. Um, if one doesn't pass, they may run it again or request to run it again, but it's a maximum of only two elections in a 12 month period. If there, and there have been situations where two have been run, they both failed, then the school district would have to wait, you know, that period you know, and then they would have to wait until at least the 12 months has elapsed since the first one before trying again. That really hasn't happened too much. Sometimes there'll be a break, you know, but um, yeah, but we've had them all around year round. We've had them right before Christmas. We've had them in the summer. <laughs> so citizens, let's say, can go to Florida for the winter. The referenda is announced in November after they've gone. They hold the referenda, let's say in March, and the people come back from Florida in May and they find out their school taxes are raised and they had no right. chance to vote because they weren't even aware of it. And it will, one thing on that, if you're following, um, you know, if you're following the news, let's say like online, let's say Delaware online, or just use them as an example, you know, certainly you see about that, you know, certainly if that ever happens to anybody, contact us and get an absentee ballot because absentee voting is definitely available in school elections, just like regular elections. So we, we certainly would encourage you um, to do that as well. Um, Good. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, school boards as well. Um, absentee is available. One, and I apologize to say, Marilyn, Tanda, I just want to say one more quick thing about, uh, and I didn't mention this in the presentation, but just a little anomaly little anomaly, not if you will, or un, not anomaly, I shouldn't say, but a little unusual factor in Delaware law, many people don't know, is that you actually don't need to be a registered voter to vote in school elections. Um, that's actually, historically, it's been the case for forever. Um, you just need to be 18 years of age or older by the day of the election, a resident of the school district, and of course, a citizen of the United States. Um, but you don't have to be a registered voter. Now, practically 99% really or more are, but um, if you, you could come in every election cycle, we have a handful, maybe a dozen um, in pref referenda, possibly more folks who do that. And we, and we have a provision for those folks to vote. They complete an affidavit affirming their eligibility and they're permitted to vote, even if they're not registered. Thank you. Marlis? Um, I have a question about if an individual does not drive a car, so doesn't apply for a driver's license, how mm -hmm. do they go about becoming a registered voter? Sure. You can, um, if you have access to um, the internet, well, I'm going to be back up even before then. Even if you're not a driver, uh, if you go have a state ID, you're also offered that option as well. Um, the other agencies, if you, if you do seek services at either Health and Social Services or Department of Labor, but if you don't, certainly, um, you can always go online 
you can go to iVote, the voter portal, iVote.de.gov and register there. Um, we have other options as well. We can print a form out even from the website if you prefer just to do that and mail it in. You could call our office, request an application, or you could come into our office and we'll fill it out. Um, so also, a lot of our, you know, a lot of people that don't have access to the internet are, are um, not, that's not an easy process for mm -hmm. them. So where, where is that process or is that process outlined anywhere other than on a website or other on the internet? How would it end up? Um, a that? lot of it is primarily, I will say, on the internet, to be honest with you, but you can certainly contact, uh, you can always, like, for example, call our office if someone wants to call. Like, if, are most people here in Newcastle County, for example, on yes. here? Um, our group is, yes. Okay. I'm just yeah, thinking I can about give... those voters that are not. Mm -hmm. oh, the ones that are present at this kind of a sure. no I was just going to even give the phone number you know if you want it you know but um you can always just contact our office um you know even for example um Delaware for example Delaware has some other um tools such as the uh you may have heard even of like the 211, the Delaware information line, that's just general. If you call, if you just call that 211, they can connect you right to us, to elections, and, and we can help you out, get you, mail you an application, um, postage paid envelope, for example. We can do it all by paper. That's certainly possible as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we still service people in house by phone, you know, anyway. A lot of it is online, but certainly not exclusively. You sure. mentioned something about the state service centers or, or um, for example, if someone had an, a housing, um, a Section 8 housing certificate, mm -hmm. would that qualify them to register or would they still yeah. go you just the Yeah, you just need to have to register. You just need to have some proof of identity and some proof of residence. It could be, um, we don't have an exhaustive list or an exclusive list. Um, I mean, granted, many people, yes, have a driver's license or state ID, but you could have another form of um, ID. Maybe you have a work ID, um, for example, or you have, um, you know, some other sort of identification card and you have a uh, mail to document, um, you know, your mailing address or your, your physical address. We register you at your physical address. Um, you can always have a mailing address but we do require a physical address for your registration because that is where um, we assign you based on your district as well. But we don't have an exclusive list. And just like, it's very similar at Delaware law, I, I think is intentional in that way uh, at the polling place as well. You know, Delaware does, we do ask for identification at the polling place, but it's not, the photo ID is not required at the polling place. Um, and I know it's a little off registration, but just a note on that is that at the polling place, for example, if you arrive on election day at the polling place and you either don't have identification with you or you choose not to show identification, which is your choice, um, and you are on the poll list, you are at the correct polling place, you're an active voter. I mentioned earlier about inactive voters, people with mail issues, you know, everything's good, you're an active voter. You can sign an affidavit um, affirming your identity and you're permitted to vote. That's always been a provision of Delaware law. So it, we have a lot of flexibility on that. We don't have any defined lists of IDs. So anything that just pro basically can show us your identity and your residence, like example to register is, is what we need. I have a question about electronic voting. Mm -hmm. I know there was a brief period after COVID started um, before the new legislation was passed, mm -hmm. um, but after the state of emergency was declared that there was guidance saying that anyone could go onto iVote and um, request the absentee uh, voting without having to give one of the usual reasons. Right. And I was one of those who did that. And I had an electronic voting option, which I yeah. found interesting rather than just the mail-in. Right. And so I just have questions about that how comfortable you are with the security of that and whether you see that expanding over time mm -hmm. um, as being another way that would become part of the norm of how people vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Delaware law um, has, has allowed, actually federal law requires that we uh, at least provide some electronic access to um, military and overseas voters. That's been in place since 2010. And then in uh, Delaware law started 
uh, in 20, excuse me, but actually it was really 2009, the 2010 and then 2012 Delaware expanded it to those who were, who voters were sick or disabled. So um, again, we've offered that for quite some time, even, you know, even pre-COVID. And it, again, like I mentioned earlier, it's a self-affirmation. So you, you, you affirm that. And we do have electronic delivery and return options as you are familiar with. Um, I always like to stress very intentionally that it's not actual voting online in any means. It's basically how you receive and return the ballot uh, because that's what we do on our end is that ballot, uh, once it's received, it is actually, um, there are nonpartisan, bipartisan or nonpartisan uh, depending on the party affiliation, teams that actually review those ballots. And they're actually reproduced on a physical ballot, just like a mailed ballot that are scanned. And we always maintain that documentation. Um, we have very rigorous security around that. Um, I was mentioning a little bit in the presentation about our technology and information department here in the state. We work really hand in hand with them so that there's multiple, many layers of security on that. And since the vote itself is not actually cast online, it's just actually how the uh, marked ballot is returned. Um, again, and our, our procedure is such that always a physical, a physical ballot's reproduced. And there's always backup documentation showing what you sent to make sure it matches. So yeah, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, I know there's, um, I know it's a challenge because people on both sides, I mean, people want access and we want to provide access, but I know that not, Everyone's comfortable with the security, but um, we we the security I can tell you is very uh, robust on that, and we have a lot of safeguards. Um, there's a lot of talk about voting online, literally voting online. Um, my opinion, for you know, is that um, you know we're, we're not there yet, securely. Perhaps someday, perhaps someday, but we're not there yet. Um, there needs to be more development of and more discrete ways of maintaining that security. Thanks. Sandy? I just wanted to say, um, just uh, singing Anthony's praises, in the uh, 2020 election, we, my husband, Roger, and I had chosen to um, request the absentee ballots. And for the primary, the ballot didn't come in time. We called, it was a couple of days before, and we called Anthony and he said, I'll go get one and drive it to your house. Oh so you can fill it out. Oh, I remember that now. It in. And <laughs> we, we said, thank you. We didn't take your kind offer. Uh, we put our masks on and went over to HB and it it's, wasn't a real busy time. So that worked out. But I just want to say that is certainly going above and beyond the call of duty, oh, especially at such a crazy time. And everything went smoothly for the... Oh. We did absentee vote. Uh, we did our absentee ballots during the general election and everything arrived on time and whatnot. But uh, oh, good. thank you for thank your you. dedication. Oh, appreciate it. I remember that now. I look at your name, I remember that now. <laughs> it was certainly an interesting year. Let me tell you, an interesting year. Whew. Not Like none ever. Hopefully like none ever again, I hope. <laughs> right. I have one other question uh, in terms of sort of the audits afterwards. Uh, For the almost 20 states that are not yet participating in that collaborative, mm -hmm. how do you know if someone is double voting, you know, here and in one of those non-collaborating states? Is mm -hmm. there any audit that's done to try to check for that kind of thing happening? We, um, there, sometimes we are contacted by those other states. You know, it could be another individual state that has some evidence, some reason to, to, to suspect someone has, has voted twice. I will say that, um, you know, when you hear some of these numbers tossed around and, um, you know, it's true, it really is accurate because I, I've, you know, myself have done research and have read up a lot on this. You know, since now the number is, you know, a bit higher, but since the year 2000, um, there's, something on the order of one or 1.1 or 1.2 billion votes have been cast in the United States in all elections. And there is fewer than 50 instances of true voter fraud, meaning voting more than once in one in jurisdiction. Um, I'm not saying that that means that's all that ever happened, certainly, you know, but um, I know from our experience in dealing with those 30 plus states, um, it's exceedingly rare, exceedingly rare. What you do see and what Eric helps with tremendously is that situation of people possibly being registered in more than one state. 
which in and of itself is not a crime. You know, usually it's an oversight. Um, when you vote more than once, yes, that is a crime for sure. But um, yeah, and Eric really helps us with that. And usually the good news with Eric is you catch that early before that potential is there. Um, yeah, Eric, I can't say enough about that. That has been just a, such a tremendous asset. You know, I was very personally very fortunate to be involved in the beginning when we were putting Eric together. Um, it was actually a there was actually it was the the Pew. If you, I'm sure you've heard of the the, the Pew Charitable Trust. Pew Center for the States um, was where that initiated from. That was a project of the Pew Center. And um, they spun that off into its own nonprofit now. And um, that was, gosh, 10 years ago now. And um, it was really kind of a radical idea at the time. And, and, you know, there was a ton of meetings and a lot of it, you know, was pre Zoom. So a lot, most of it was in person back then it was pre COVID too, of course. Um, and, um, you know, getting that right. And I think that's probably like the biggest advance we've made is, is that because to get that information now, you know, and I mentioned 30, 31, we're hoping it's gonna be made up to 35, 36 this year, hopefully, um, and eventually, hopefully all 50. There are some states where it may not ever happen. The environment is such that it may not ever happen, but most are, I mean, it's bipartisan, the number of states represented, you know, in there. There's, you know, you have states that are deeply red and to, to deeply blue states now, all who see the value of it which it is tremendous value. So yeah, it's, it's been a real boon for us. I think it's one of the best things we've done. Well, if there no, oh, go ahead. Tell, tell again the acronym for ERIC, what does it stand um, for? Electronic Registration Information Center. And they have a website, ericstates.org. Um, it kind of gives you like a, a quick overview of, of what it is. They have some cool like diagrams on there. It shows like all the inputs of the data. Yeah, the people that developed the, the matching, it's, a, it's an extremely rigorous like algorithm or algorithms, I should say, where they match the potential. So it's a very high level of confidence so that there's not false matches because you certainly don't want to remove or, or, or potentially remove someone from the list you know, unless you're absolutely sure. Now, even though Eric helps us, you know, um, again, you still have those safeguards in place, you know, again, even though through Eric, you generally are getting a good address, you're not, for example, sending something to a bad address to reconfirm, you're getting a good address. If we still don't hear back from that person, we still have those, that, that, kind, of, that kind of circuit breaker in place where we have to wait, we still can't automatically remove them. But people from Eric, generally, we hear back from them a very high percentage of those people because we're getting them at the right address in their new state and they want to respond and they send it right back and it's postage paid it's very easy you know very quick susan did you have a question yeah, i just have one comment mm -hmm. that I, I have totally appreciated this experience tonight anthony you are a wealth of information and i appreciate your being you. with us but i hope that this kind of presentation is being done for our youth in high schools and in college because i i have to tell you i have learned so much tonight that i never learned in high school or college so oh. hopefully i don't know how this works but i hope that with all the things that we're trying to say are important mm -hmm. for high schoolers and college students to learn this is paramount to sure. me sure thank you very much thank, so, you. thank, thank you. you we do yeah we definitely try to do as much outreach as we can Mm -hmm. um, schools and, and uh, yeah, it's very important. I agree that the, the young people learn about this and the value. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, for our country, it's very important. Yeah. It's, it's our it's our democracy, you know. Right. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I mean, absolutely. These, these days, just having a video of you doing the presentation like you did for us this evening and making it available, mm -hmm. you know, on online publishing, publicizing it through mm -hmm. the things that they watch. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and listen to through their social media outlets sure. might be a good way of, you know, getting yeah. the word out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Well, I want to bring this to a close because we are way past our time. <laughs> we usually say we're going to do a hard cutoff by 8.15. We've gone well mm -hmm. over. So thank you so much for your time this evening, Anthony. We have greatly appreciated it. Thank oh, you. thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. Everybody. Thank, thank you for having thank me. It's so a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Lynn. 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 Yes. yes. Lynn. Lynn. I have a question. Uh, one question, Anthony, it's historical. Did Delaware take part in the cross-check program uh, that predated Eric? 
No, we did not. Uh, Delaware was never part of, of Crosscheck um, prior to Eric. And um, there was, um, many years ago, there was some talk about that, uh, you know, possibly, you know, many, many years ago, but it was determined that it, um, at that time that it uh, wasn't something we were gonna participate in. But uh, Eric, you know, basically takes on um, a lot of the aspects of, of, of what Crosscheck was and really even enhances them, even adds a lot of added value to it. Yeah, Crosscheck was, cross was not very effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the, the challenges that it faced, yeah. But Eric definitely is effective for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, Sue, I'm glad you were able to get that last question in there. <laughs> Thanks. <I know. laughs> All right, well, oh, once again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you and good, good night. night. Take care. Bye. Thank you.